coming in. And we're also now live on YouTube. So hello to our YouTube viewers as well, our audiences um, around the world, in Europe and the US and from all over the world watching today. So we'll give it just 20 more seconds as people are coming in. And then we'll start. Okay, so happy Douglas week, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be, be with you all today. Um, I'm Caroline, I'm Dr. Caroline Schroeder from the Douglas week team. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be with you here tonight. And um, thank you for joining us, everyone. We're delighted that um, you're here for Douglas week. And we're very happy to talk about Frederick Douglas, about his journey to Ireland and the continued legacy of Frederick Douglas, which is what this panel will talk about. And before we uh, begin this great event. Um, I just want to say a few little things about housekeeping. So one is um, this panel will last about an hour. And if you have any questions, you can pop them in the Q&A box down below. We'll monitor the uh, Q&A box and we'll pass all your questions on to the um, speakers. And then also for your information, the, this is being and it will be um, available on our YouTube channel uh, after Douglas Week. And um, yeah, we hope that you enjoy this event. And I will now hand over to the wonderful uh, Professor Christine Keneally, um, whom we've seen in many great uh, events this week already and who's shared so generously her time and experience and knowledge with us. So she'll guide us through the conversation today. And uh, Christine, I hand over to you. Happy Douglas Week. Oh, thank you. So thank you, Caroline. Again, uh, congratulations to you and to all your team for organizing what's been a fantastic week. I know two more days still to go, some more fantastic things still coming. And just, I'm in on the East Coast of America, so good morning as well as good evening and good afternoon to everyone. So I have what I consider a dream team around me, and I'm really delighted that um, I'm part of this team as well. But today I'm going to moderate, and I'm going to introduce the team, and then I'm going to ask a series of questions. And if we have time at the end, we'll take some questions from the audience. So firstly, I'd like to introduce you to Dennis Brownlee. Dennis is the founder and president of the African American Irish Diaspora Network. He became connected with Ireland after he began researching his family ancestry, following up on information that his mother had shared with him about his Scots-Irish ancestry, in addition to his African-American identity. Dennis has had extensive career as an entrepreneur and business development executive in media and entertainment, working with Steve Harvey and Quincy Jones, amongst many others. Dennis is an Emmy Award-winning executive producer and his IT management firm became one of Black Enterprise Magazine's top 100 companies. Dennis is a graduate of Princeton University. So Dennis, you're very welcome. Next, Stella. Stella O'Leary founded Irish American Democrats Political Action Committee in 1996 to campaign for the re-election of President Clinton enabling him to complete the Northern Ireland peace negotiations he had initiated in his first term in office. Subsequent to the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, Stella worked with Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama to promote US involvement in protecting the agreement. President Obama appointed Stella as an observer to the International Fund for Ireland, where she served for seven years, working with political and community leaders throughout Ireland to develop and sustain programs that fostered peace and cooperation between nationalists and unionists. So Stella, you're very welcome. Next, Keith Wright. Keith served for 23 years in the New York State Assembly, chairing committees on housing, election law, social services and labor. His work on the Equal Economic Opportunity and Human Rights Subcommittee sought protection for domestic workers and created additional benefits for senior citizens. Leading the Public Housing Subcommittee, he championed the rights of public housing residents. Keith also chaired the Black, Puerto Rican and Hispanic Legislative Caucuses and was member of the Puerto Rican Hispanic Task Force. Active in his Harlem community, Keith has helped foster small business development, create affordable housing, and increase opportunities for youth. He has also served as chairman of the Harlem Community Development Corporation. So very warm welcome to Keith. Thank you. Finally, and not of course least, Don Mullen. 
Dawn is a best-selling author, filmmaker, concept developer, and humanitarian. His publications include Eyewitness Bloody Sunday 1997, which was a primary catalyst for the Bloody Sunday Inquiry, the longest running and most expensive public inquiry in British legal history. Don is the recipient of several international awards, including the Defender of Human Dignity Award in 2003, and is the first non-US recipient of the Race Amity Medal of Honor in 2015. He is the inspiration behind three major pieces of public art, including the statues of Frederick Douglass at the University of Maryland and Quinnipiac University. He republished the narrative of Frederick Douglass in 2011 to commemorate the visit to Ireland of President Barack Obama. Don, you are very, very welcome. So as you can see, is a dream team. And without further ado, I want to address this first question to Dennis. And then I'll go to the rest of the panel. So Dennis, could you tell us a little about your work and interests and how it relates to Frederick Douglass and his legacy? Oh, sure. Uh, and first of all, thank you, Christine, for moderating this panel today on behalf of uh, the African American Irish Network. Uh, I'm pleased that we are joined today by three of our distinguished board members. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, Keith Wright, Stella O'Leary, and Don Mullen. And uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity also to thank Carolyn uh, Schroeder for her leadership in putting this wonderful Douglas Week celebration together. Uh, we formally launched uh, AAIDN, uh, the African American Irish Diaspora Network, almost exactly a year uh, ago, last February. Uh, and the mission of AAIDN is to foster relationships between African Americans in Ireland uh, based on shared heritage and culture. Uh, and the idea to form the organization was actually born out of work that we started doing uh, to celebrate the 175th anniversary of Frederick Douglass's transformation. Uh, or transformative visit to, to, to Ireland uh, that took place in 1845. As we started down that path, it became clear that there was a need to bring this community together, um, you know, with 38% uh, of African Americans who have some Irish ancestry, uh, but also those who have uh, an affinity uh, with Ireland through shared uh, culture, uh, community, uh, spirit, and other connections. Uh, many of our activities in our first year of operation have focused on celebrating uh, this uh, Frederick Douglass anniversary. Uh, we had initially planned to conduct a heritage tour of Ireland around the time uh, of year that Frederick first uh, landed in Ireland in September. But this was disrupted uh, because of the COVID pandemic, of course. And instead, we ended up doing a number of webinars and discussion groups, uh, among other activities. And we partnered with the Museum of Literature Ireland to stage a Frederick Douglass exhibition, uh, which you can view online and which we hope will be open again soon on site to visit in person. Uh, and we produced the documentary short film that has been shown throughout Douglass Week, Agitate, 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 which you co-wrote, Christine, and uh, which one of our other distinguished board members, Nettie Washington Douglass, Frederick's great-great-granddaughter narrated. So one of the first missions of the African-American Irish Diaspora Network has been to bring greater light to the magnificent contributions that Frederick Douglass made to our society. Okay, thank you, Dennis, thank you. Stella, would you like to um, follow up with us? Yeah, well, when I formed the PAC in 1996, uh, I became a part of the official meetings of the Democratic National Committee and also uh, was in touch with the Congress and quickly learned that that was the closest I've been in the Democratic Party. I, it was the closest proximity I've had to African Americans. And uh, I, I learned a lot uh, from meeting them and hearing them. And one of the things I learned was that many of them were not just associated with the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland, but several of the congressional members had already been there. And I became very close to Congress, uh, the late Congressman Don Payne of New Jersey who had been, who had marched uh, with civil rights workers in Northern Ireland. And then I would occasionally hear them refer to Irish politicians who had been um, prominent in civil rights work in the past, but, uh, especially the Kennedys, Robert and John. And so that led me to uh, start thinking about uh, the, the 
the closeness of the Irish American leaders, political leaders, and African Americans, which led me back to Frederick Douglass. And I realized that that was the beginning, I suppose, of the, the connection between and the affinity between Irish American politicians and the meeting with Daniel O'Connell. And so that's how, um, that's how I progressed to take a greater interest in um, Frederick Douglass. Okay, and I'm sure with the election of President Biden and his new vice president, it right. continues. It's, you know, it's, it's very heartening. It's great. Thank you, Stella. Thank you. Keith, could you tell us something about your work, please? Oh, sure. Listen, I um, first of all, I'm very honored to join you here this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you might be. Um, I, you know, the work and I guess the question was, uh, how does the legacy of how did the legacy of Frederick Douglass uh, impact upon uh, me personally? Well, you know, there are two things that Douglass uh, has said that that has always resonated with me and in my life's work. Um, and 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 quite frankly, my parents would, would always uh, quote these two sayings. One was, uh, "Without struggle, there is no progress." It's number one, and. And as, and as Dennis said, agitate, agitate, agitate. Uh, my father used to always say that to me. Now, uh, and as a young child, I didn't necessarily understand it. Uh, but as I uh, started making my way through the political system, because I always had a deep abiding um, uh, interest in politics. Um, uh, and uh, you know, when I was in elective office, um, you know, if you don't, there's an old expression, a closed mouth always goes hungry. And so I always <laughs> tried to open my mouth uh, <laughs> necessary and to agitate, agitate, agitate on behalf of my community. Um, these are the words that, I mean, that Douglas said, I guess, oh, back in, in the early 1800s and such, and they still resonate today. You know, Douglas was very astute in so many ways, as we all know. He understood that the struggle for human rights, the struggle for civil rights, the struggle for basic rights uh, in, in America um, was, was, could not be done alone. Um, matter of fact, he might have been the first person to try and make America great. I did not say make America great again, but to make America great. Yeah. Because, you know, we, you know, you can't do anything on a homogeneous level. I mean, you just, um, when, when countries go to war, what do they do? They first try to elicit, uh, solicit allies and such. Douglas was, 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 I mean, astute enough, and I'm going back to the early 1800s to be able to take his sojourn over to Ireland and to um, uh, recruit the folks because um, uh, civil rights uh, and basic rights in America was, was the same fight over in Ireland. Um, and so you have to recruit the allies. So um, uh, certainly Douglas is, I, I've signed many a letter saying without struggle, there is no progress. Douglas still resonates today. Uh, in not only my house, but also in terms of all the things that he that he was able to do, he was a clarion call. I mean, he was he was the focal point of of, of basic human rights uh, throughout the world, uh, which was quite. I mean, you know, you didn't have fax machines back then, you didn't have uh, computers back then, you did not have uh, Twitter back then. So imagine, imagine. Um, how powerful a voice he was um, in, in order for folks in Ireland uh, to be talking about him and, 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 and in order for us to be talking about him to this very day. So I want to say thank you for allowing me to participate. Um, and although I'm not a Douglas scholar by any stretch of the imagination, um, uh, but certainly uh, his work uh, going back into the, from the 1800s, still impacts upon me today and through my life's work. Okay, okay, thank you, Keith. And you heard it here first, Frederick Douglass started the MAG movement, 
Nice. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Another pioneering moment. M A G. M A G. Okay. Yeah. I want to cap M A G. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Keith. And Thank John, you. Uh, would you like to speak to some of your work? Yeah, I, I suppose I was born into a society that was spiraling towards crisis because of um, the injustice that my community uh, were suffering as Catholics in the north of Ireland. And uh, our civil rights movement was very much inspired by the black civil rights movement in the United States. And the songs that we sang and the slogans that we shouted were all inspired by the black civil rights movement. And indeed, you know, one of our great leaders in Derry, uh, the late John Hume, um, you know, was significant when he was being lowered into the grave last year, uh, that spontaneously the people around his grave began to sing, we shall overcome. So again, even that echo going back to uh, the black civil rights uh, movement. And, and I think, you know, that made it natural to not only see our struggle in the context of Ireland, but also in a broader international context. So when I was a witness to the tragic events of Bloody Sunday in 1972, you know, I, as a young 15 year old schoolboy, could hear people around me comparing it to the Sharpeville massacre in South Africa and the Milai massacre in Vietnam and so on. And, uh, and I developed a, a huge interest, not only in human rights in Ireland, but also internationally. Um, I developed a, an immense respect and interest in the continent of Africa. And uh, one of those, when I decided that violence was not the way forward, um, I wanted to learn you know, about, from people who were agitating for change um, because there is systemic change that must be changed, but how do you do it through nonviolence? And one of the people was Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, whose friendship I enjoy to this day. Uh, it's been a great blessing, in fact. And uh, he actually inspired a project called the Great Famine Project in relation to Ireland's great hunger of 1845 to 1852. And while working on that, I came across the story of an escaped slave who came to Ireland who compared his experience as a slave back in America with the plight of the poor in Ireland. I was very, very taken by that. That was probably somewhere around the, the late 1980s. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, when Senator Barack Obama uh, decided to run for office, uh, I remember thinking, you know, the story of Frederick Douglass in Ireland could actually be very helpful to him. Um, because I've always looked at ways of how the great diasporas of Ireland and Africa in the United States could actually work together, you know, for the good of Ireland as well as the good of the continent of Africa. And so I actually still retain the letter I sent to Senator Obama uh, in, I think it was 1998. And shortly after that, after his election, I remember going over and uh, it was the former Congressman Joe Crowley suggested I go to an event that Stella was hosting uh, in a hotel uh, to talk about um, like Frederick Douglass in Ireland. Um, so there's, there's lots of connections there, but that's just to give you kind of a flavor of where my interest in Frederick Douglass came from and uh, my own work, which still is about human rights. And you see the continent of Africa there behind me and one of the great projects that uh, I'm working on is Africa's Great Green Wall, which is probably one of the most audacious environmental um, projects on the planet and uh, we'll be working a lot to engage African American, hopefully Irish America, in the near future in that project also. So, so Don, uh, if if I if I might ask, uh, you also had a role in uh, inspiring uh, some of Christine's interest uh, and scholarship in in Frederick Douglass. Yeah. Well, well, Christine and I have been great friends for a long, long time, particularly from the point of view of, um, you know, the Great Hunger. And uh, I suppose the one thing that we all loved about Christine was that she was not a snooty uh, academic. Um, you know, that she was always very approachable, but also an activist. She was prepared to get her hands dirty and to kind of come and walk with us and all sorts of things as well, you know. So uh, it was natural then, I think, that we, we kind of pollinated each other's ideas. 
Thank you. Yeah, uh, Don and I have known each other 30 years and uh, he's a great inspiration to me all the time. So thank you for yeah, saying yeah. that, Dennis. Thank you. Um, so some of you who have mentioned this already, but could I just ask you to elaborate a bit more on when you first encountered Frederick? I know some of you have said, and but in what ways did he speak to you? What was it that made Frederick so special? And Stella, could I start with you, please? Yes. Um... Well, yeah, I think that, you know, um, his relationship with Daniel O'Connell was, uh, you know, very much always very important to me. Um, the, I, I actually knew about that before I came to the United States. I'm surprised to hear a lot of Americans, including Dennis, say that they did not know about uh, Daniel O'Connell being in Ireland when they were growing up in America. I did know. I did know about him. But uh, what impresses me most about him uh, is... Uh, that he never seems to seem to be burdened by um, by uh, grievances. That uh, you know he didn't allow th things to interrupt his uh, his quest for social justice and freedom. He didn't allow grievance to undermine him, uh, or distract him. And um, I I think that you know to be able to do what he did while at the same time developing his own talents as an orator as a writer, as a musician, uh, as a family man, a traveler. But he lived a very, very rich life. And um, so I think that's, that is a model to all of us, that we can agitate and at the same time develop our own talents. OK, thank you, Stella. Don, can you speak to that? I know you've well, addressed some of it. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, you know, the idea that uh, he wasn't burdened by grievances, that's a very interesting insight. Um, uh, the thing about when, when Douglas came to Ireland, I think, was he, he wanted to learn. He wasn't just there to give a message, and he was, uh, his ears were open um, for new learning. And, of course, it was with great excitement and anticipation that he went to Conciliation Hall to uh, hear um, Daniel O'Connell. And it's when you read his letters back to the abolitionist movement, and particularly Garrison, and he almost repeats verbatim what O'Connell is saying in terms of it's not enough for me as an Irish man to be only concerned about what's happening in Ireland. I have to be concerned about the plights of poor people and suffering people all over the world. And, you know, this is one of the things that I explored in the introduction to the narrative of Frederick Douglass, which I published in 2011, is that after hearing that speech, you know, you can actually then follow the letters in the subsequent months back to Garrison, and you can actually see the thinking of Frederick Douglass changing. And effectively, he's saying it's not enough for us to be concerned only about, you know, ending slavery in the United States. We have to be concerned about the plight of the suffering all over the world. And I think that, you know, if there's any really great gift that Ireland gave to Frederick Douglass, which I think stood to him for the rest of his life and allowed him to reach a level of the stature of Daniel O'Connell in, you know, as an elder statesman in, in years to come is the fact that he came to Ireland as a single issue campaigner, but he left an internationalist. And for me, that's what makes me very proud of the contribution of Ireland to Frederick Douglass. Okay, thank you, John. Keith, would you like to speak to this? What? Yeah, what struck me, uh, what has struck me early on about Frederick Douglass is that, yes, he was this tremendous um, leader and this tremendous voice um, uh, against slavery and uh, the voice for uh, African and African-American people here in the United States, but he spoke to everyone. I mean, his voice, his rationales, his reasoning um, uh, uh, connected with everyone, white and black. Um, and as I said, it goes back, he knew how to create allies, if you will. Um, and that, you know, that, that white people would be, able, would be able to hear him as well as black folks would be able to hear him and understand him. Um, you know, and, and, and that's what struck me. Uh, when you talk about his evolution, if you will, I'm reminiscent of when Malcolm X went to Mecca. Uh, and, and, and he evolved uh, in terms of his ideologies and philosophies and such. So it just shows that everybody 
um, uh, you know, you can reinvent yourself and, and everybody can learn, but you still have that same foundation and that same um, foundation. Uh, and, and, and that was the, um, the freedom of all people. Yeah. And if I can, thank you, Keith. If I can just add women, because you- Women, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, 1848, Seneca Falls. He was incredible in that sense. Okay. Thank you, Keith, thank you. Um, Dennis, uh, how about for you? Yeah, um, you know, of course, my first encounter with Frederick Douglass was when I was a kid uh, in school and, you know, just seeing the images of him and the, the, the very distinguished nature of the person that, that he appeared to be in, in those photographs first struck my, my interest. And it was such a counter to, um, you know, all the other imagery and, and, and what we were seeing in our history books of black people in enslavement. And it has inspired me to learn more about him and his life and how uh, he lived his life, what he did, and and the leadership uh, uh, stature that that he achieved. And you know, I came to appreciate that you know, if he was able to accomplish what he was able to uh, in his lifetime uh, back in the uh, uh, 19th century and escape slavery and educate himself and uh, then become a counselor to presidents, uh, if he could do that, then whatever discrimination and bigotry we were experiencing in the 50s and 60s as I was growing up, uh, I should be able to overcome those challenges and, and, and achieve uh, you know, uh, great things in my lifetime as well. And so I'd have to say that uh, Frederick was one of those figures who was just really inspirational to me uh, as, a, as a young black man growing up. Okay, thank you, Dennis. So you talked about discrimination and Keith talked about agitate, agitate, agitate. And I just have to say, Frederick, he actually did steal that phrase from Daniel O'Connell, but he absolutely <laughs> made it his own. So yeah, there they are linked again. Um, but in terms of agitate, 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 or what John Lewis called good trouble, how do you think that informs us today as we live in such tumultuous times? How can we use it and apply it to try and win Frederick's goal of equality? Um, Keith, can I start with you, please? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, Frederick Douglass is the alpha and the omega is where, where it all starts uh, for American history. Um, it's, uh, he was the, the first agitator, if you the first one making good trouble. I mean, we all, I mean, the civil rights movement uh, and, and all that went into it started with him, uh, basically. So, um, you know, it's the, and, and, and we, we, to this day, we can all learn uh, from his struggles. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, as, as Dennis said, for a man to be able to uh, be born into slavery, educate himself and become this national and international uh, voice uh, and to counsel presidents. And I said the same thing. I mean, you know, I, mean, I grew up during the time of when uh, blacks were not allowed to drink from the same water fountain. I mean, uh, you know, when we used to go down and visit our relatives, we had to, you know, take the back roads, if you will. Uh, I, I remember all of that. And, um, uh, so it's, um, but, but, but Fre it, it all begins with Frederick Douglass. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Don, how about for you? Well, uh, I think it's very important that, uh, we, there are times when you are facing an oppressor, when you just have to, you know, stand and look them in the eye and say this far and no further. And, um, and I suppose that's very much in my DNA as uh, an Irish person and particularly uh, been born into and growing up uh, amongst an oppressed community in, in the north of Ireland. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, what amazes me is that when you read the depth and the quality of the narrative of Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave, and consider like he was only 27 when he came to Ireland, and that's why I was really anxious that the statue that we would produce, uh, which still really needs to come to Ireland as well, uh, what would be of Frederick Douglass at that age. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. And I actually thought of Frederick Douglass, you know, during the inauguration uh, recently of President Biden, Biden. And like the person who stole the show was this young, like uh, African-American black woman, Amanda Gorman, like, and again, the depth, you know, of, of that poem 
it spoke so eloquently. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, well, here is a, a female Frederick Douglass in the making, you know, and I think she's one to, one to be watching and how proud we all felt, you know, that this young uh, African-American woman um, could really speak to the whole world and, and literally become a superstar overnight. And, and what a voice to have. And if I can just, I mean, Amanda was just, I think she blew everyone away, but yeah. she was interviewed the next day and she cited Frederick Douglass as one of her inspirations, so, um, which you know, makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, and Camilla Horace going as well, standing in front of uh, the, the portrait of Frederick Douglass somewhere in Congress and remembering the fact that she is standing on the shoulders of so many people who made it possible for her to, to reach the ceiling and, and, and to break the glass. Yeah. Yeah, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Stella, how about you? Yeah, when I, I, I think agitate, 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 and Black Lives Matter and um, good trouble, I think that these are all very, very important elements that should be sustained, you know, for civil rights. But I think the most impressive thing at the moment is the, uh, the, the Black use of the franchise. Uh, I think Biden would not be in the White House if it were not for the black vote. And the, uh, the organization, uh, political organization with the black, within the black community is very, very impressive. 12% uh, of the House of Representatives is now black, which represents the share of African Americans in, 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 in the nation. And um, not just that, but with the help of Nancy Pelosi, the Powerful Ways and Means Committee is 50% of the Democrats element of the uh, House Ways and Means. So, and she went uh, on a trip on Brexit to uh, Ireland and to Britain recently. And she specially requested that she bring Stephen Horsford, a young black American uh, elected member from Nevada with her. So uh, I would substitute vote, vote, vote for agitate, agitate, agitate. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Okay. Uh, Dennis, how about you? Well, you know, I, I agree with Stella. Vote, vote, vote is, is uh, you know, the, the message of the day. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, Frederick would add that to, to agitate, 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 because, um, you know, uh, pushing for the vote for African-Americans and, and then for women uh, was, uh, was very important uh, to Frederick. And, and you know, the, one of the uh, uh, chief causes that, that he fought for uh, and that he advocated for. Uh, but uh, I, I would also, uh, you know, like to just uh, reference uh, some other words of, of Frederick uh, that would go along with, with agitate, agitate, agitate that I think uh, are, are very appropriate for today. And it might have been taken from the same uh, speech that, uh, that Keith referenced earlier, and it kind of follows up on Don's comments also. And uh, it was in 1857 that Frederick said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Mm -hmm. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those who they oppose. And I think that, uh, you know, those words were never more true than they are today. And I, I think if Frederick were with us today, I think he'd say that we have come a long way since his time, but we still have a long way to go to, to achieve full equity uh, and equality in our society. And when we look at things like incarceration rates of people in our community and income differentials, education differentials, structural barriers to advancement and everything from corporate America to head coaches in football and basketball, sports in which we are overwhelmingly represented as players. We still face bias and discrimination. And uh, prejudice against the other did not start here in America and it will not end here, but each of us bears a responsibility to help elevate humanity to a level of fairness and equality for all people, no matter their origin, race, sexual preference, religion, or other difference. And, you know, Frederick would still be at the, uh, the head of the charge uh, in that fight. Okay, thank you. And Dennis, could you maybe speak to, um, some people may not know that Frederick actually was nominated to run as vice president. Could you speak uh, to yeah. that? 
Yeah, he was. I, I don't remember the, the exact year, but uh, he, he was nominated uh, by, I guess it was the, uh, the Women's Suffrage Party. Uh, and, and he was uh, nominated as vice president. He, he wasn't aware at the time that he was being nominated. He wasn't active, but he, was, uh, he actually set the precedent for, for Kamala Harris. And then he was, uh, uh, I believe, and you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, Christine, but he was also uh, one of the first, uh, was he the first delegate or was he one of the first uh, electors, uh, black electors uh, that was chosen uh, uh, somewhat later? Yeah, he was. And um, he was nominated for vice president to run as vice president in uh, 1872 and uh, alongside a woman. So it was, of course, they were never going to get elected. She was actually in prison on the day of the election. So, you know, it's quite a story, but as with everything with Frederick, it's fascinating. It was still a first. It was still a first. Yeah. <laughs> it was absolutely a first. Yeah. Yeah. Meant another first uh, as well as Mag. So, um, can I ask you, what do you think is, and again, you've hinted at it, but what do you think is Frederick's greatest legacy? And there are many, but what would, for you personally, is his greatest legacy? And can I start with Don, please? Um, I love the speech that he gave uh, in Chicago, I think it was in 1883, in relation to Haiti. Yeah. Um, I think it's, you know, the fact that he was one of the first uh, Black ambassadors anywhere in the world, but... Um, I think that he was actually prepared to put his career on the line in defense of the Haitian people and that he resigned in protest over American foreign policy towards Haiti. And in fact, you know, Guantanamo Bay would have been actually in Haiti if it hadn't been for Frederick. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that he um, spoke so eloquently about uh, Toussaint Louverture, uh, who actually you know, led the first uh, black insurrection of slaves and created the first black republic uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And I, I'm so concerned that why is Haiti the poorest country in the Northern, in, in the Western world? And it's not because it's black. It's not because it, uh, it lacked intelligence or all of these prejudicial kind of uh, things that were said about the Irish as well, how we could not uh, manage ourselves and, and rule ourselves. It was because Haiti became a huge threat to four major superpowers in the region, uh, France, Great Britain, uh, Spain, and the United States, and all of whom locked Haiti down so that it couldn't trade with its neighbors. And then in a very weakened state, you know, the, uh, the French came back and under threat of war, forced Haiti to pay from, uh, I think it was around, um, uh, when was it? It was in the late 1900s, I think, or uh, until about, I think, 1947, a reparation tax to slave owners uh, in, in France. And uh, such austerity forced upon the Haitian people. Uh, they have never recovered from it. And, you know, we've talked about this as well. One of the things I really want to do, you know, with yourself uh, eventually, Christine, is have a major conference on Toussaint Louverture. The French have never given his body back um, to the Haitian people. I've been to um, you know, the, the Pantheon in Port-au-Prince and the one thing that's very clear is the absence of the presence of Toussaint Louverture. And I think France really needs to be made accountable for that. But we also need to force them to pay back that reparation that they forced upon the Haitian people. You know, so that Haiti can have a chance to kind of get back on its feet. And for me, that's one of the great legacies of Frederick Douglass, that he held Haiti up as a great nation and a nation that needed to be uh, championed in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's actually my favourite speech. Um, I know people love Fourth of July, but I love that speech mm -hmm. he actually made in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, Don, can you just tell people who may not know how Toussaint ended up in France, his remains? Well, um, uh, Leclerc, who was, uh, um, I think he was the brother-in-law of, of Napoleon, uh, he invited uh, Toussaint to um, kind of a peace talks. Mm -hmm. And Toussaint was a bit uh, afraid, but um, or not afraid, but he was a bit weary, but nonetheless he went. But as soon as they got their hands on Toussaint, they uh, took him in prisoner, put him on a frigate, and sailed him across the Atlantic uh, to Bre Brest. And then they, they rode him right across France to the Jura Mountains um, to Fort de Jure. 
and uh, it was absolutely horrific, particularly the diet and as well as the, the weather. And I mean, I've been into the cell where Tucson Overture died and I mean, to see and to hear how he actually died, like huddled up, sitting on a chair, huddled up at the fire, trying to heat himself. And that's how he was found in that position dead uh, by guards in the morning who came to, to look at him. Uh, but again, it was by um, subterfuge and lies on the part of the French. And um, so really France has a lot to answer for in terms of the suffering of, of the Haitian people and must be made accountable even to this day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Keith, would you like to speak to Frederick's greatest legacy? Well, you? listen, I was just sitting here on the edge of my seat listening to Don. Um, uh, just, you know, uh, just, I mean, absolutely fascinating. And the fact, and, and what I was going to say, the fact that we're still, and I've said it before, the fact that we'll still, we'll, we are still talking about Frederick Douglass today. So with Frederick Douglass, um, uh, I mean, taking such an interest in Haiti and the injustices that have been exercised on Haiti, um, you know, it, the same thing could be said today. The same thing could be said today. I mean, Haiti has been so taken advantage of uh, by this country uh, other countries. Uh, Haiti has been raped for its 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 natural resources. Haiti has been um, just used and abused, and it's still happening to this day. And the fact that Frederick Douglass uh, made that one of his core issues, I mean, it's just, and then we're still talking about it to this day. I mean, that's what I think should be the, um, should be a recurring theme, that we're still, you know, I mean, as much as things change, they remain the same. Uh, in so, so many ways. And uh, the fact that we're still talking about uh, the struggle that, that Frederick Douglass took on uh, in Haiti and around the world, I mean, I mean, it, it just talks about his lasting legacy. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Dennis, how about for you? Oh, well, his lasting legacy to me is that he never let slavery or the conditions that he found himself in uh, when he was born into this world, define him. Uh, and he never let the society around him define him. And he took agency to take control of his own life uh, and his own destiny. And I think that's the lasting legacy and the lasting lesson uh, for, for us today, uh, for all of us, that we have to take control of our own fate. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dennis. And Stella, how about for you? I would have to say uh, it's a wide-ranging legacy, but the Democratic Party will be part of, certainly part of the legacy. But also, I would like to say this organization, uh, the African American Irish Diaspora, um, is very interesting um, legacy. Um, I mean, it's the first Irish American organization founded and headed by an African American. So that in itself is uh, part of the legacy. And also the programs that uh, Dennis is laying out uh, for, for the uh, organization, they will achieve the, the proximity that uh, Brian Stevenson talked the other day about the fact that one of the missing elements uh, to bridge the, this racial divide uh, is proximity, that we're not close enough to each other. So the kind of programs that Dennis is planning, uh, I think uh, have a, will have a great effect in, in that regard. Um, whether they be student exchanges, uh, uh, bringing African Americans to Ireland through film, through, um, uh, through bringing students to Northern Ireland for civil rights, um, and so forth. And it's, I'm already mentioning some of them. I, I get lost. He has so many. But anyway, I think that that kind of positive activism is, uh, is very, much, uh, very much part of uh, Douglas's legacy. Okay, and in some ways you've preempted this, but in what ways can we ensure that Frederick's legacy is better known and honored? So Dennis, can I ask you to start? Oh, sure, uh, well, you know, thank you Stella for, for uh, you know, mm -hmm. those uh, wonderful positive comments about uh, African American Irish Diaspora Network. And, uh, you know, we are trying to continue uh, that, that legacy of Frederick Douglass um, and, and bringing people together. Um, and one of the ways that we're, we're planning to do that uh, going forward, a uh, project that uh, you're uh, helping to lead for us, Christine, 
uh, in, and that's putting in place the um, uh, Tourism and Heritage Trail in Ireland, the Frederick Douglass Way, uh, that will trace the journey of Frederick Douglass through Ireland and uh, uh, provide information about uh, some of his speeches and his accomplishments there. Uh, and it'll, it will provide markers uh, along the way. It'll tie into the National Famine Way and the Wild Atlantic Way, uh, but particularly the, the Famine Way, because when Frederick arrived in uh, Ireland, it was at the beginning of, of the Great Famine and, and that had a great uh, impact on, on him and his, his worldview. Uh, and his uh, uh, view that uh, the Irish were oppressed so much and that he needed to fight for a uh, fight against the oppression of all people throughout the world and not just the African Americans who were enslaved. Um, and so uh, with the Frederick Douglass Way in Ireland and uh, a companion trail in the United States, which we were calling the Frederick Douglass Trail, which will uh, highlight uh, places of his great accomplishments and speeches uh, uh, and achievements here in, in the United States. Uh, that's one of the things that we plan to do. Uh, and another one is an initiative that uh, the Don is leading for us and that's to establish an annual uh, Douglas O'Connell uh, lecture and, uh, and awards uh, ceremony uh, in gala that, uh, that we plan to, uh, to launch uh, next year. And uh, that will, uh, you know, Don uh, uh, was the stimulus behind the initial uh, Douglas O'Connell uh, uh, lecture and address uh, back in uh, 2014 that featured uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, as the keynote. And then uh, followed uh, uh, earlier this week uh, by the second uh, address uh, in the Douglas O'Connell lecture series uh, with Brian Stevenson to, to, to launch Douglas Week. Uh, and so we are continuing that tradition uh, with an annual Douglas O'Connell lecture that will take place uh, alternately each year in uh, the United States and then in Ireland. Uh, so those are just some of the things we're also doing, uh, as Stella said, uh, social justice and uh, civil rights uh, 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 seminars that, that uh, we are conducting with Irish universities and African-American universities along with uh, various consulates in the United States. Uh, and we have a number of other programs, uh, but uh, you know, all of this, in fact, uh, as I said, when I, when I first uh, uh, started uh, at the beginning of, 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 this, um, of this session, uh, you know, was inspired by uh, you know, starting to, to honor Frederick Douglass and, and uh, his journey to Ireland in, in 1845. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Stella, do you want to add anything else? Well, about no, I think that uh, obviously um, Dennis and I see the, uh, see the African American dias Irish diaspora uh, as a very much a big part of the, the legacy. And, um, you know, apart from that, I, I, you know, the, the two interests of mine currently are that and the, the work of the Democratic Party and the amount of uh, the amount of achievement, as you mentioned early, you know, the, the Obama, Biden, Biden, Harris. I mean, that is a, a wonderful, wonderful phenomenon. And, you know, you often wonder if these riots and so forth are not, are not a uh, resistance to the uh, rapid rise of um, interest in, in justice and to the work of the Black Lives Matter um, organization and so forth. So I think there is a there's great activity uh, and great interest in the United States at the moment in these subjects, um, and it, which is borne out by all the, the amount of writing about them, including your own, by the way, and congratulations for, uh, for all that you've contributed to, to Frederick Douglass's legacy. Just amazing. I know the years and years of work went into it, but it was worth it, Christine. So, <laughs> Thank you. Know, Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, and you are you are a big part of the legacy. Um, but no, that that is it. I think the uh, the institutions are working well um, on the right side. But uh, we have to try to uh, to do what we can to um, to solve the problems that are out there in the spirit of Frederick Douglass. Okay. Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Don. How about for you? Yeah, um, I find it. Um, 
interesting. I think that the work that the African American Irish Diaspora Network is doing and plans to do in the future, you know, is is really important. Um, and I think not just in terms of highlighting the, the legacy of Frederick Douglass, but I think also the legacy of, of Daniel O'Connell. Uh, you know, it's interesting to hear Stella, you know, talk about Frederick Douglass in the context of the Democratic Party, whereas in fact, of course, he was a Republican. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm watching avidly at night through CNN, the impeachment trial, uh, you know, given what happened on the 6th of, of January uh, at the Capitol. And it's hard to believe, you know, that those on the Republican side are belonging to the same party of Lincoln and, and Frederick Douglass. They must be turning in their graves, you know. So I think that highlighting the importance of Frederick Douglass, I think also, you know, really holds up, uh, you know, a huge mirror, you know, in the face of, of the Republican Party and saying, like, how far have you strayed and why have you strayed, you know, away from this wonderful, wonderful legacy? Um, you know, and, and then from a personal point of view, I put so much work into the, uh, the statue of, of Frederick Douglass you know, with the cloak of Daniel O'Connell, the, the long coat of, uh, of uh, Abraham Lincoln, the out extended hand of Barack Obama, and, uh, you know, holding the, the narrative first edition, yes, the narrative the first edition, which we, actual edition, which we gave to um, President, as she, when she was then President Mary McAleese, you know, and uh, I'm determined to get it up, uh, you know, very soon in, in Ireland, um, it will be the first statue in Ireland to an African-American and the first statue in Europe to Frederick Douglass. And uh, I think that would be a wonderful legacy if we can achieve that sooner rather than later. Okay, okay, thank you, Don. And Keith, how about you? Well, you know, I, I, I um, first of all, I've been, I'm very happy to be a part of this group and work that Dennis uh, and, and, and us as a network are, are, are putting forth is, is great and fantastic, but we shouldn't have to do it. We should not have to do it. Um, listen, black history should be, slavery should be taught in our public schools uh, from kindergarten all the way up uh, through high school and colleges should be a requirement. Uh, and of course, Frederick Douglass is a big part of, 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 of that history. And black history certainly is American history as well. And uh, with, you know, but for, but for slavery, this country wouldn't be built and wouldn't, you know, and, and would not exist and would not be in the positions that it's, that it's in. So we shouldn't have to do the work, but in lieu of um, that not being done and racism still being alive and well, we have to do what we have to do and we have to, uh, agitate, 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 and without struggle, and of course, a lot of it is struggle, there will be no progress. So, um, so certainly, um, you know, in lieu of uh, anybody doing it for us, I mean, certainly this network uh, will have to do it until, um, until uh, I guess, uh, other things happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Keith. So we have about six minutes left. So this is the final question. And I want to ask you, apart from Frederick, who we all love, who, which African American or black person do you admire most? And um, I'm going to start this with Don. And you can sneak in more than one. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Desmond Tutu, but he's not African American, but certainly he's one of the great Africans that I absolutely love. Uh, I have a great draw for uh, Rosa Parks and an African American whom I've really grown to love and respect in recent years is Dr. Uh, William Smitty Smith of the National Center for Race Amity in Boston. I think the work that he is doing, you know, both in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and also in terms of across the nation and creating a Race Amity Day is really admirable and, and requires, I think, deserves a lot of support. Can you maybe speak, you, know, you have a great Rosa Parks story. Can you please share it with us? Well, I, I interviewed Rosa Parks in uh, 1998 after my book on Bloody Sunday came out. And uh, I flew from Dublin to JFK. And at that time, TWA were still flying. So I went across to the TWA terminal 
because that's where I was getting the flight from uh, New York to Detroit. And I always love to be the last person to go on a plane. I hate all of this crushing and stuff. So I let people get on and they'll always call you anyway, you know. And uh, so I had my ticket and I was walking up and uh, there was a young African-American woman and she was checking the ticket and she was being very professional. And she said to me, uh, do you have business in Detroit, Mr. Mullen? And I said, you wouldn't believe it. I'm going to interview tomorrow, uh, Miss Rosa Parks. And she says, oh, really? She says, just wait for a moment. And she walked off with my ticket. And I couldn't enter the plane because now she had my ticket. So I just had to wait in the gangway. And she eventually came back and she handed me a first class ticket. And she said, if you're going to see Miss Parks, we've got to take care of you. So the next day, I spoke to Miss Parks and I told her the story. And I said, Miss Parks, little did you realize when you refused to give up your seat to a white man in Montgomery, Alabama, that you would actually set in motion a chain of events that would one day lead to a young African-American woman having the power to give a foreign white man a first class seat in a domestic flight. And she just smiled, this faraway smile, you know. But it was, a, it was a very special that that would happen on my way to meet with, with Miss Parks. Okay, thank you, Tom. And Keith, how about you? Well, I'll, you know, certainly what com comes to mind is uh, Muhammad Ali for me. Uh, um, I mean, he was a warrior and, uh, you know, and we still talk about him to this day, but I'm going to sneak in and I sh I'm not sneaking in. I'm just saying it very proudly. Uh, Harriet Tubman uh, certainly for me did it. Um, someone who I just cannot believe the things that she was able to do. Uh, what resonated with me was when she said, you know, however many slaves she freed, I would have freed more, but they had to know that they were slaves. They didn't know that they were slaves. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so those two resonate with me. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Mm. Stella, how about you? Well, prior to last November, I would have said Brian Stevenson, because I think he's a saint in what he does for the incarcerated people on death row and the lynching museum. But after November, my, I'd have to say, Stacey Abrams. Mm. Stacey Abrams is my heroine. And uh, I think she's amazing and uh, incredible work and uh, made, such, made such a difference, obviously, in the, in the Georgia election. Uh -huh. I wish I had her skills politically. <laughs> She's great. Okay, thank you, Stella. It's great to hear all these women. Thank you. Thanks, Stella. And final word goes to Dennis. Uh, well, well, Stella, I, I've got to say, you've got your own political skills, uh, which are quite admirable. <laughs> uh, but in, in terms of uh, African Americans or, or Black people that uh, are, are on my list, uh, they're, they're, it's, it's a long list. And, you know, I would have to uh, second... Uh, you know, some earlier comments of, uh, of Keith about uh, Malcolm X and the inspiration uh, that, that he provided, uh, you know, as, as he went through his journey. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, and also I would like to, uh, to second his, uh, his nod to Muhammad Ali uh, as a true warrior and, and a peace advocate uh, and, and someone who, who really changed the dynamic of, of how African Americans were viewed uh, through, through his journey. Uh, uh, you know, I'd say Shirley Chisholm uh, with the courage that, that she showed in, in her political career. And, you know, finally, you know, I just want to highlight, uh, you know, someone of, of our time, uh, Ken Chenault, the uh, recently retired uh, chairman and CEO of American Express. Uh, and his leadership of, of that corporation for so long uh, that uh, was, was so accomplished and, uh, you know, set a standard as, you know, one of the, the leading, if not the leading uh, black person as a CEO of a major company with a completely unblemished record and, and just such tremendous achievements during his time. I think uh, he'll go down in, in, the, in the history books uh, for his great achievements uh, in that area as well. Okay, well, Christine, could I just say that Muhammad Ali's, I believe, grandmother was Irish. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. There's a statue to Muhammad Ali. Where's John? Uh, no, actually, Stella, that's very interesting because my great friend Andrew Edwards, who did the Frederick Douglass statue, he's yeah. actually done a statue of Muhammad Ali, 
And I'm currently in discussions with uh, Clare County Council through a great friend, uh, Ken McHugh, and I think Ken is listening in. And we're hoping also to get the statue of Muhammad Ali uh, erected uh, in County Clare. Excellent, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 11.59. I'm really yeah. sorry I have to bring this panel to an end. Uh, I've been asked, has Don Mullen got a website? Yes, he has. So please look him up, visit his website. Aidan, African American Irish Diaspora Network also has a website. So please visit if you want to know more about their work. Thank you. You really have been a dream team. So thank you, Dennis, Stella, Don and Keith. You're all fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Many thanks to you all and thanks to everyone who joined us online. Uh, we really look forward to hearing more about the work of this African American Irish Diaspora Network. Thank you all to the panelists and the work of Douglas Week continues. We've got more great panels and conversations and exhibitions going on. Please check us out online again, douglasandcork.com. Uh, tonight at 7 p.m. We have a reform through photography event featuring John Stauffer. Uh, there's also a poetry ev uh, evening this evening, 8 p.m. GMT. And uh, we will close Douglas Week on Sunday with a very special event featuring, as was discussed many times during this conversation, some very inspirational women, um, and uh, including uh, former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, and Nettie Washington Douglas from the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. So thanks everyone for your support. Thanks to this panel and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.